something miraculous is about to happen. It's something most of us do about 600 times a day. It's time for a nice, light lunch. This man is swallowing. The journey from lips to stomach is the same for every swallow. But you'd be amazed at the things that go in and the things that doctors have pulled out. 30 hooks, that was all stuck in his esophagus. When a swallow goes wrong, everyone's smiling. I think I'm dying. It can become a life or death struggle. The doctors actually said it, it don't even send an ambulance, should be in the morgue. From sword swallowers to competitive eaters. Tearing these things apart. Oh, I can eat. I'll probably eat this camera in a minute. Ah! The extraordinary swallow is a hard act to follow. is in training. This performer, teacher, daredevil, and fire breather treats his body as though he were an Olympic athlete. His gold medal event, the sword swallow. I got into sword swallowing as a result of uh, wishing to explore the boundaries of human experience. His boundaries are on the inside. I learned a number of unusual things about my body that I didn't expect to learn, and that is, one, my esophagus isn't exactly straight, and a sword is. The internal journey from mouth to stomach is a minefield. The sharp sword passes within tenths of an inch of vital organs. A lapse in concentration could mean a puncture, internal bleeding, even death. After the epiglottis comes the heart. If I drop the sword into my body too quickly, the sword will hit the back of my heart very hard, and I will be left with this enormously uh, well, painful shooting electrical sensation throughout my entire body. As impressive as sword swallowing looks from the outside, the real action goes on inside. And to see that, Roderick has booked a consultation at the radiology department of Wilkes-Barre Hospital with gastroenterologist Dr. David Moore. I actually had an individual that swallowed a pen. I've seen keys, orthodontic appliances. We have different devices which we can use to retrieve these from the stomach or the esophagus. But really one has to be incredibly careful with this. Uh, it's just a fragile organ. I'm gonna pull this across tight. Okay. Yeah. Staff position a fluoroscope and Roderick positions his sword. They're about to watch a truly remarkable intervention into the human body. The mouth opens, and before the sword has traveled two inches comes its first hurdle, the gag reflex. But the gag reflex never, ever goes away. It's, it's being able to swallow a sword does not involve a lack of gag reflex. It involves the ability to suspend the gag reflex. The gag reflex is what stops most people swallowing foreign objects. 12 months solid training has enabled Roderick to overcome it. The sword is passing several key organs. It's oral cavity, cervical esophagus. Now past the esophagus, it's going through the distal esophagus. It's now an inch from his beating heart. And the tip of the sword is now in the lower esophagus and almost in the stomach. The point has now reached his stomach. If Roderick were to wrench while that sword was down there, that wrench alone would, could bring the stomach right up onto the tip of the sword or could lacerate the esophagus. Swallowing a sword is never comfortable, I have to say that, and you never quite get fully used to it. There's always fear involved, which is a healthy thing. There is a metal bar going through the middle of your body, forcing you to have perfect posture. Sword swallowers lubricate their blades to help them go down. Most use saliva, some edible oil.
50 true sword swallowers in the United States. Once a year, most of them gather here, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. The get-together is part of the American Sideshow Convention. In Carney speak, a swallower is a blade glomer or a steel slurper. They call swallowing to drop a blade. <laughs> Magicians and illusionists have been known to use fake swords for their acts. But there's nothing fake about this gathering. Just ask Dan Meyer. Sometimes people are just in disbelief. They're just frozen. They're like, you know, they can't believe that this is really real. I'll, I'll usually call a doctor up on stage or a nurse or an EMT, let them double check the sword, try and bend it and make sure it's real. And then I'll let them pull it out of my throat so they can tell that it really is real. The world record for the amount of sword swallowed is 16 in the throat at once, set in 1937 by famed performer Lucky Ball. The women's world record stands at 12 swords. Of course, records were made to be broken. Belly dancer Natasha Varushka is lucky to be alive. Three years ago, she attempted a multiple sword swallowing. It went very wrong. Somebody bumped into me and I had three swords and they scissored. They scissored on me. An admirer had tried to slip a $500 bill into Varushka's costume, accidentally bumping her. The swords inside her slipped and scissor-like ripped her insides. I lost 53% of my blood, 53%. They, um, the doctors actually said, it, it, don't even send an ambulance, she'll be in the morgue. Once the blood loss was stabilized, doctors repaired the damage operating through an endoscope. Incredibly, Natasha was back on stage one month to the day after her near-death experience. Now she's about to attempt a world record. To warm up, eight swords. The blades are carefully clipped together, making them look like a multi-handled single sword. Each blade is a tenth of an inch thick. Combined, the blades will be roughly the thickness of a baseball bat handle. Nobody should try this. Even sword swallowers who want to do this is really difficult. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, eight swords at once. Everything shuts down. You can't hear, breathe, see, everything. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a death. You can't, you suffocate. Thirteen swords linked together will give Natasha a new world record. She slides 12 swords in, in one go. The 13th is handed in. The combined thickness of the blades is now nearly an inch and a half of unbending steel. Oh, baby. Yeah. A new world record, just waiting to be broken by the next blade glomer with a taste for steel. Yes, that's a world record! A lot of this is mind over matter stuff, okay? This is swallow cam, what the medical profession call an endoscope. It's a tiny camera on the end of a long, flexible tube. When a doctor wants to take a picture on your inside, here's what he sees. That's the epiglottis right there. Okay, and that looks fine. And doctors have seen a lot. A week doesn't go by that we don't see something uh, new and interesting and often surprising. You can talk to a pin or a safety pin or a toy. He had a pair of eyeglasses in his stomach. Swallowed a fork, and she just didn't know how she did it. What do we have? Some 1,500 people a year die from swallowing foreign objects. I need a respiratory therapist. But fortunately, of the tens of thousands of cases fronting hospital emergency rooms, most objects pass through the gut and out the other okay, end. Okay, somebody clear the way here. About 10 to 20 percent will require endoscopic removal, and only about 1 percent require surgery. 
Aww. Children will swallow just about everything. In fact, it's only natural. Well, the first thing they've got to do on their own was pick up food off a plate and put it in their mouth, and they really don't know if something's food or not. A toddler's insatiable curiosity about the world is their biggest asset, but can become a liability. Just ask Waltz and Joette Unks. We have one daughter, Sarah, she's five years old, and a son, Jonah, right now he's 21 months old. Um, 22 months. Okay, 22 <laughs> months. We'll, we'll let her do the interview. The Unks are fastidious parents, more so than your average mom and dad. They have to be. At birth, baby Jonah's esophagus didn't connect with his stomach. It emptied into his lungs. Now that's um, a lethal condition if not treated with surgery. Fortunately for Jonah, his condition was diagnosed within hours of birth. And we uh, mostly usually try to repair those uh, within the first day or two of life. And in the vast majority of cases, we're able to uh, get the two ends of the esophagus together and close the communication to the airway. But the unks were warned. Jonah's operation left him with scarring, which made his esophagus smaller than normal. Sooner or later, there was little doubt he would choke on food. Jonah was an accident waiting to happen. We had ordered Chinese food. Right. And so, I guess, did you go get it? I you went remember. to get it. Okay, I went to get it. And while, you... I, while I took the kids to the garden. And... He was not even two when the inevitable happened. Jonah had been playing in the garden by the tomato plant with his sister, Sarah. She came in and said, I just fed Jonah a cherry tomato, which, you know, A, any child his age should not eat something, a food like that. And Jonah's esophagus does not work normally. We kind of tensed up a little bit when she said that and then said, oh, well, he seems fine and, and sat him down to eat. And then he was very eager to eat and then he took a bite and he just, it completely changed. He started crying and screaming and it was different than anything we had said he had ever seen him do. And there was visible pain. Yeah. The Yunks were confronted by their worst fear. Something was stuck in Jonah's esophagus. Uh, yes, could I have the pediatric surgeon on call? At the hospital, the unks were told that Jonah would need surgery to unblock his esophagus. The clock kept ticking in that waiting room. That's when it got scary to me. I was afraid they had had, had to open him all the way up. Doctors had to act quickly. When the surgeon went in, there was no sign of a cherry tomato. What they did find was a surprise. The cause of the blockage was this. And it turns out that it wasn't a cherry tomato, uh, as we thought. It was a, a, a child's or a doll's eyeball. So Dr. Skinner came out with the, um, with the eye in a little specimen jar, and he says, does this look familiar? The eye had fallen off Sarah's hobby horse. 75,000 times a year, a parent calls the poison center because their child has swallowed a foreign object. Jonah was the one in 10 who needed medical help. It's a sharp little eye. It, the, it is sharp. The edges of that eye are, are very sharp, much rougher than the tomato that we thought it was. Green, very good. Jonah was just doing what small children do. See shiny object, pop it in your mouth. Grown-ups should know better. Okay, I'm a little ahead of you. Yeah. No, okay. Luther McLaughlin is a busy man. So when he developed a stomach ache one day, he didn't pay much attention. But the pain wouldn't go away. I was having trouble sleeping at night. Uh, couldn't sit, couldn't focus on things. It was just, just kind of an annoyance. His family physician thought he might have had an ulcer. A CAT scan revealed nothing. But the pain got worse. Luther was admitted to the University of Pennsylvania Hospital. He was there for 12 days of testing. A biopsy for cancer came up negative. The doctors couldn't figure it out. That left one option. This video was recorded by gastroenterologist Dr. Gregory Ginsberg using an endoscope camera. 
What we saw was an ulceration in the first portion of the duodenum. The next thing the doctor saw came as a complete surprise. They identified something sticking up there, and when they cleaned away some food and stuff from it, they identified a toothpick sticking in me. A toothpick had been stuck in Luther's intestine for months. It had passed right through his stomach. The thing is, Luther didn't even know he'd swallowed it. I would have never guessed that a toothpick could cause the pain and suffering and just the inability to, to focus and do my work and just really a, a, a major nuisance over such a long period of time, over a five-month period. Turns out Luther had been at an office party and had eaten some finger food, toothpick and all, without knowing it. <laughs> the sharp end of a toothpick can be lethal. They've been known to pierce the esophagus and enter the heart. The leap from finger food to open heart surgery is surprisingly simple. Luther is a lucky man, thanks to Dr. Ginsburg. Unapologetically, in an effort to um, place my name in the, in the great lexicon of uh, medical eponyms, have called Ginsburg's triad. And this is the perilous combination of cocktails, conversation, and finger foods. The body's ability to cope with sharp objects has baffled many a stomach surgeon. At El Camino Hospital in San Francisco, there's a board of gastro fame showing swallowed objects retrieved from patients. On the East Coast, Pennsylvania's Mutter Museum has its own bizarre array of swallowed objects. This hairball was removed from the stomach of a 12-year-old girl. From the age of six, she'd been sucking, then eating her own hair, strand by strand. It's a psychological disorder called pica. Duke University's Dr. John Bailey has seen it all, from attention-seeking prisoners to the mentally disturbed, to the just plain accidental. And I've seen amazing things, razor blades and all sorts of irregular shapes pass through the bowel without causing damage. Dr. Bailey's latest patient is a teenager who swallowed an open safety pin. At this point, it's going round the colon and will eventually find its way out. If that point was pointing the other way, we would be concerned that that would perforate the colon and cause peritonitis. So this patient is being followed with daily x-rays. The torrent of food and liquid that passes through the body allows objects like this to go with the flow. Taking advantage of the body's self-defense mechanism, Darren Hunsley's remarkable performance. It's time for a nice, light lunch. This is no illusion. That's a real light bulb mm. with real glass. Hunsley has cut his thumb doing the trick. Down it goes. Once he's crunched the glass into tiny pieces, it will wash down with a lot of liquid. The sharp edges are then coated with food and other digestibles in the stomach. As our food goes through our gastrointestinal tract, there's a constant turning and twisting of everything that goes through. Also, foreign objects are going to be coated or wrapped around the material that's in our GI tract, which in some ways provides a cushion as it goes through and may take a sharp object coated enough so that it becomes a blunt object in a sense and won't produce a perforation. Nothing beats glass. Definitely do not try this at home. Nor this. Party time at Jim Bagley's place. A heady mix of alcohol and a lazy afternoon leads to some game play. So we were playing an old game called quarters where you bounce a quarter into uh, a beer mug and then you point to someone and they have to drink the beer and then catch the quarter in their mouth. Jim's turn for the catch. 
And just like old times, he does it with ease. I have it in my mouth and I'm proud of myself that I did it. And just at that moment, someone walked by and said, nice job, Jimmy. And <laughs> Good job. <laughs> they thought I was joking and just pretending to to be choking on this thing. Meanwhile, I couldn't breathe. Are you all right? The game was no longer a joke. The coin was now firmly lodged in Jim's windpipe. What are you doing? I was gasping for air. I just couldn't get a breath. And it was just, as it was going down, it was getting worse. I mean, I was probably turning blue. In a few minutes, his brain would shut down and death would occur unless someone acted quickly. And then a bunch of people who had been drinking for a while started hitting me and slamming my chest and my back and someone came up and eventually did a, their version of a Heinrich maneuver and dislodged it. But it continued on down. When I was choking, I mean, it was scary, you know, to look around and see everyone smiling and going about their business at a party and I, I, I think I'm dying. You know, I could not breathe. I couldn't get a gasp of air at all. And uh, I just, I thought to myself, is this how I'm gonna die at this party? <laughs> and doing something as stupid as drinking a beer and trying to catch a quarter? God damn. I was dying there. Gonna I, get thought, I, I swear to God, I'm kidding. Yeah, you have to be in a trick. I couldn't breathe. Can you feel it? I couldn't breathe. <clears throat> I can't feel it now. Jim but was yeah. lucky. Oh my God. You know, it's, it is where it is. <laughs> Choking kills four Americans a day on average. Jim could easily have become a statistic. As for the quarter... Well, the time between the swallowing and the passing was, uh, I think it was just a day and a half. I was in the bathroom. I didn't even think about it. And I just happened to walk back, and I looked down, and a quarter just dropped right there. It was like, don't know where it came from. just came down, and um, nature took its place. Jim's accidental swallow is minor league in the annals of the esophagus. In France, there's a man known locally as Monsieur Mange Tout. Literally, it means Mr. Eat All. This is the breakfast of Michel Le Tito. Rich in iron. Ooh. Every mouthful, a potential stomach ache in the making. And if you think this is a trick, believe your eyes. Here's the fluoroscope x ray to prove it. Latito has been eating metal and glass for decades. It began accidentally when he was nine. I was drinking and the glass broke. And I'd heard of eating glass, so I ate it. Then I told my friends and they didn't believe me. So I ate glass again and cut myself. So from then on, I practiced to get the right technique. He soon graduated to beer bottles, then champagne. Then he made the leap to metal by eating a bicycle at the county fair. His true calling had arrived. The bike went down well, though the chain was a problem and became stuck inside me. Fortunately, a doctor was able to extract the chain from my rectum. In his younger days, Lucito became a gastronomic cause celebre. Armed with just a pair of tin cutters, he would devour a bicycle wheel in just 20 minutes. Cameras would follow him to the supermarket and delight at his dinner selection. Then the champion chomper would cheerfully gnash his way through a main course. The piece de resistance? Over a two-year period, Latito devoured an entire Cessna aeroplane. Monsieur Latito's long-suffering doctor has been treating him for 25 years. It was uh, very painful sometimes for him and for the people that see him in that condition. Dr. Marzal has examined Letito inside and out and claims he is as normal as any of his other patients. He's a normal man, he can eat it because of, of his mind. It's for him uh, first uh, to be himself, 
and to prove around him that he's different. But it's not all mind over mana. Latino doesn't actually chew his metal meals, though it looks like it. Small things like nuts and bolts go down whole. Larger objects are cut into bite-sized chunks, then swallowed. Which is not to say Latito doesn't eat sharp objects. Marzal also discovered Latito has an extra thick stomach wall, handy for those razor blades. Here we can see again some pieces of razor blade in the stomach. We can also see screws in the intestine and also at the same level as the rectum. And these items pass through a few hours after taking this x-ray. Dr. Marzol's pain no doubt made worse by the thought that he would have to dig out any stuck items. When you eat something like a, a TV set or, the, or, or a computer, certainly the components are very, are very dangerous. Other than occasionally indulging in a tasty dish, Monsieur Letito's days as a professional eater are behind him. And in retirement, he can gaze out at the world from his French chateau, comfortable in the knowledge that he is one of a kind. Deliberate swallowers, like sideshow performers, trade on their ability to overcome the gag reflex on the way in and make a clean exit on the way out. But what goes down doesn't always come up. Imagine swallowing this. Because that's exactly what happened to 13-year-old Hamish Wilkinson. This is the north coast of Australia's island state, Tasmania, famous for its wilderness areas and its seafood. The local delicacy is squid, and you catch them with one of these, a squid jig. Squid jigs that we were using, they were about this long, and they were torpedo-shaped, about this thick as my finger, and skirted around the bottom of them, there are about 32 razor-sharp hooks. Now, they're not barbed, but they're extremely sharp. And what happens is, once they're set into it, particularly soft flesh, then they embed themselves very firmly. The octopus-like squid are attracted to the fish-shaped lure and wrap themselves around it. Once caught on the barbs, there's no escape. Hamish Wilkinson and his friend Brandon were fishing on the pier. Brandon made his last cast for the day. Instead of landing in the water, the squid jig was caught. Then, horror. Suddenly Hamish started to make some strange gagging type noises. When I turned around and saw the line in his mouth and my squid jig was on the end, I thought, oh, I've probably killed him. It had landed at the very back of Hamish's throat. What was worse, his swallow reflex had automatically kicked in. And all 32 hooks were now digging into his neck from the inside. The lure is not designed to be pulled out. Any attempt would rip through his soft tissue, his vocal cords, his throat. And it had gone so far already, I couldn't even see the squid jig at all. The squid jig had clawed its way four inches down Hamish's throat. It was lodged right across his windpipe. He was suffocating. We need an ambulance urgently. And I remember thinking to myself that if I don't look after this boy very carefully, he's going to die in front of my eyes. OK, don't try and talk, mate. Just breathe. How's your breathing? But I can't the you paramedics know? had never dealt with a person who had swallowed a 32 bar lure. The only chance was an operating table, and the nearest hospital was two hours away. I've never seen anything like it in my um, 15 years within the ambulance service. They picked up the local doctor to stay with Hamish on the long trip and try to keep him alive. Dr. Mooney phoned ahead to the hospital. 
Unfortunately, the people on the other end of the phone had never seen or heard of a squid jig, so that they didn't quite understand the uh, possible gravity of the situation. An X-ray taken at Launceston Hospital revealed just how desperate the situation was. Once they got the X-ray, suddenly they all got very interested because they could see that there was a major obstruction that they weren't aware they didn't really appreciate. The OR staff prepared for a life-saving operation. Getting this lure's hooks out of Hamish's throat was going to test even the most skilled of surgeons. That's the squid jig and there's the 30 hooks there. That was all stuck in his esophagus. Hamish's airway is quite compromised. With the squid jig lodged so precariously in Hamish's throat, the medical team had to improvise a way of getting it out. If they attempted to pull the lure out the way it went in, it would rip out Hamish's vocal cords. But this was a dire emergency, and Hamish's life was on the line. There was only one thing to be done. The surgeon had to take a section out of Hamish's esophagus. The operation worked. Now a young man, Hamish is alive to tell the tale. How a simple afternoon's fishing became a life-threatening trauma. As you do when you're a 13 year old, we're mucking around and having heaps of fun. When Hamish laughed quite loud, he'd put his head back and open his mouth. Unfortunately, on this occasion, the squid jig happened to be coming back through the air and Hamish didn't see it and it popped straight into his mouth. And the automated, automated response was to swallow it. When I was lying in the jetty, a lot of things were going through my mind. I was, firstly I was worried about whether I was going to live. It's not a story he enjoys revisiting. There was a moment when I was going into theatre when um, my father actually said, like, like, I think he actually said goodbye to me, but I'm not 100% sure. And, um, God, <laughs> that was a Hamish will carry the scars of this trauma for the rest of his life. Oh, this is the, this is the scar down here. And when the surgeon went to remove the squid jig, had to come in from the side because of the barbs were trapping the squid jig in my throat. So I had to open, open up my neck. I guess he's a very lucky fellow. He's extremely lucky to be alive. And he's left with a scar and a good story. Swallowing foreign objects is not always regarded as undesirable. And one of the latest medical techniques, in fact, encourages patients to swallow. Doctors have combined the simple technique of swallowing with the complex technology of capsule cameras. With a capsule endoscopy, we have the ability to have the patient basically swallow a live video camera and see in real time what the small intestine looks like. Until this breakthrough technology, diagnosing problems deep in the gut was a combination of applied guesswork and sometimes invasive surgery. They've had five colonoscopies, five upper endoscopies, they've been hospitalized five times, and if they can undergo swallowing just one pill and it gives them the diagnosis, think of uh, all the trauma that could be saved in those patients. Now, it's a case of lie back and enjoy the ride. The camera works by sending video signals back to remote receivers worn by the patient. The camera pill is a little bigger than a standard medicine capsule and held down with water. The gut comes to life in full color. The swallow mechanism is a reflex. Usually we don't have to worry about it, but when it goes wrong, it affects every aspect of your life. This past summer really got worse. I mean, like every weekend I would just wake up with 
with a very hoarse voice and hurt. And even For years, meat, salesman Jim Denuso had been yeah, having trouble swallowing. I had pain up here in my throat and just basically by losing my voice all the time, I wanted to find out why I was losing it. What we're going to do is put a little bit... A salesman without a voice is like a boat without a paddle. They don't get far. Jim sought advice from the New York Voice and Swallow Center. We know how to swallow like we know how to breathe, like we know how to make noise. Uh, it's a fundamental uh, reflex that allows us to survive from the minute we uh, hit the ground running. Dr. Jonathan Aviv and colleagues have developed a highly specific swallow testing device which shows them exactly what's happening when a swallow goes wrong. They call it feast. Sort of like E.T.'s finger, except much smaller than E.T.'s finger. When we think of feast, we're looking for the big meal. So these are patients that have trouble getting to the big meal. Feast is actually inserted into the nose and passed down the throat. Once doctors have a clear view of the larynx, Jim is subjected to some simple tests. Can you say cookie? Cookie. 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 And a strong swallow. Again, another throat clear. I'm sorry, there's just a lot of <clears throat> phlegm that just keeps collecting there. That's it. You're doing great. Just fantastic. Just a few minutes later, Jim is presented with the results. So react. You have acid reflux affecting the larynx, the vocal cords. Caffeine, chocolate, alcohol, mint, your four favorite food groups. <laughs> uh, increase acid production. And you use your voice a lot. So what's happening is that your vocal cords are very puffy. They're all swollen like sausages. Acid reflux affects 50 million Americans. That burning results in inflammation. It's sort of like you have a golf ball in your throat, and that gives you the sensation that you can't swallow. What we advise is drinking two highball glasses of water with each meal. The message for Jim is simple. So much what you swallow can affect how you swallow. What we say is the solution to pollution is dilution. <laughs> Bugs, roaches, creepy crawlies, vermin, call them what you want. There are very few cultures on Earth who actually eat these things, right? Wrong. Americans don't eat these things, right? Wrong again. The federal government, through uh, our Food and Drug Administration, actually stipulates the number of insect parts that can be in food. Uh, ketchup has a lot of insect parts in it. Peanut butter is one of my favorites in that an average size jar of peanut butter can have up to 100 insect parts. We're talking eyes, legs, antennae, stingers, their little feetsies, their little midguts, their little rear ends. You can have 100 of those in, in an average jar of peanut butter. Straight from the professor's mouth, the insect parts are microscopic <laughs> and harmless. <laughs> In Should fact, Professor Turpin it. says that eating bugs is good for you. I actually advocate uh, eating insects because uh, they're there and because uh, they are a good food source. They are high in protein. They, are, in fact, are healthy. They're low in fat, low in salt, and high in fiber. Anybody want to try one? He's just waiting to become a meal for somebody. Students in Professor Turpin's class need to do a little extra to pass his entomology course. <laughs> First, they have to pass Bug Eating One. And dish of the day is the tomato hornworm. Known for its ferocious appetite, it can down a whole tomato in a single sitting. Not for me. Not that that impresses these guys. Looks like they're in for a tough semester. But there is a serious side to Turpin's antics. Eating insects, uh, for me at least, is one way to help people overcome their fears of unusual things and also to make them a little more appreciative of this group of animals on the earth. Go ahead, help yourself, just chew them up. Uh, it's reverse psychology of the swallow. I eat, therefore I'm interested. <laughs> Land-based insects have tended to be gastronomically shunned, but their cousins of the sea are the prized shrimp and lobster found on many a menu. Not too bad. 
If you plan on adding bugs to your diet, <laughs> Professor Turpin advises to select carefully. <laughs> Shopping for bugs is a highly skilled affair. It's not slimy. It's not? Oh, what <laughs> Some of them uh, don't want to be eaten, so they have uh, poison hairs or bad taste. Generally, any insect that is dull colored would be edible. If creepy crawlies pass the swallow test and become a new fad diet, they may one day end up in a food competition. Because it seems for every food there is, there's a competition to eat it. And the number one rule for food eating competitions is you have to swallow. Those are the best, the Anchor Bar original. Buffalo, New York. 50,000 fanatical foodies gather for one of America's great swallow tournaments. This is the home of the Buffalo Wing, invented at the Anchor Bar, and now a worldwide hit. And highlight of the third annual Buffalo Wing Festival is the officially sanctioned U.S. Buffalo Wing Eating Championships. I've played football, baseball, hockey. I'm a swimmer, I'm a lifeguard. You know, I've competed at the highest levels in all these sports, and I train just as hard for this as I do for any of those other ones, so. Competitive eating is serious business. There's even a push to make this stomach-centric sport an Olympic event. Eight points. Center stage are the champions of the chomp. Big man, Sylvester Jones and butter, hamburger, and baked bean record holder, Don Moses Lerman. Crazy Legs Conte! Holder of the pancakes, the buffet, and the green beans French style records, and the number two ranked eater in America, Ed Cookie Jarvis, holder of 12 individual eating contest records. And then there's this man mountain. We are warriors, we are athletes, we are gurgitators. Right, he's here to come. I'm here Smart to Money has him at short odds. I'm going to devour, I'm going to just eat all I can eat. I'll probably eat this camera in a minute. Ah! Badlands Booker, the right, big squawk from great. New York. Uh, the most I ever ate, okay, I remember, 13 pounds of cheesecake. I mean, you know, you can go and buy it, you know, one or two. I ate 50 and a half in six minutes. 39,000 calories. That's something for your health, people. They're like, oh my God. But the dark horse is the pocket rocket with the perfect hunger. The South Korean born, 100 pound ringing wet contender, Sonia Thomas. Then the black widow is female spider, right? And then when I got to eating contest, I'm the woman, female. And uh, female spider killed the male spider. These competitors are about to launch themselves at a nine-pound tray of chicken wings. Thank you very much. The excitement level... They'll have the 12 minutes for their feasting the frenzy. And don't let Sonia's size fool you. She packs a mean paunch with a dozen trophies for eating competitions, including one for downing 65 hard-boiled eggs. Each competitor goes through their own pre-match routine while they're reminded of the rules. Each eater has in front of them now a tray of nine pounds of wings. At the conclusion of the event, the tray will be weighed again. We will determine the exact quantity of wing meat eaten. Under the watchful gaze of the Buffalo Wing Eating Championship Trophy, the countdown begins. Five, four, three, two, one, go! for competitive eating in the world. It is known among eaters as the Mount Sinai of mastication, the Madison Square Garden of Gurgitation. They At this point, the stomachs are just filling up, but the professional eaters have a trick. They've trained their bellies to distend, allowing in more food. Pint-sized Sonia trains by only eating one meal a day. But it's a one. But they must also have hand speed, jaw strength, and stomach capacity. 
Jones, we are one and a half minute into the competition. Look at Sonia Thomas go, folks. Give us a love, my love. Is she something? Wing stripping technique is the key to getting as much chicken down as you can. And like an athlete, ignore the exhaustion and pain. As slender as the sickle in the hand of the Grim Reaper. Oh, George, I'm up here dodging chicken shrapnel. Badlands Booker is just tearing these things apart. Barely human, more like an animal. It's unbelievable. These are the greatest enemies of the chicken in the world today. They are killing these things. Their bodies tell them to stop. Their friends tell them to stop. Their family tells them to stop, but they will not stop. They will continue eating, George. They will go to the 12-minute mark. Sonia Thomas is 12 minutes, and the pressure is starting to show. But don't count 100-pound Sonia out. She may have a hidden advantage. One theory maintains that larger-sized people can't actually eat more than smaller people because their body fat stops the stomach from distending. Coming into the 15 seconds. 15 seconds, folks. All right, now, please count down with me. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That's it. Put it down. Nice work. The chicken. The carnage is over. Now it's time to weigh up the wings and see if Sonia Thomas has out-eaten men four times her weight. With 5.09 pounds of chicken wing meat. 161 wings. The new chicken wing eating champion of the world, Sonia Thomas! Sonia Thomas has done it. In 12 minutes, she's eaten a 20th of her body weight. Badlands Booker has had to swallow his pride, along with 144 buffalo wings. But he's gracious in defeat, even though beaten into third place by someone less than a quarter his weight. It feels so good. You got a top. You know, you, you finish top and then first place. Make me so pleasure. While the vanquished lick their wounds, Sonia's got plenty of room left for more. Yeah, I can eat more. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna eat some um, maybe ice cream for a little bit, you know? Every time we swallow, our bodies go into action. 26 muscles in the mouth, then the throat and esophagus all working in unison. And it seems there's very little on this earth that is inedible. When a swallow goes wrong, it can put you in hospital, or worse. Pop it into your mouth. 600 times a day, the act of swallowing proves one thing. Nothing beats glass. Whether it's a nut, a bolt, or a tuna sandwich, the human body is truly remarkable. Ah! Ah. It's all gone.